Hi everyone, welcome to Evening TV. Thanks a lot for stopping by for the Memoirs about Narcissistic Abuse Part 2. If you have not seen Part 1, I will link it below. Keep these videos from getting way too long. I just need to jump right in and get started. This is What My Bones Know by Stephanie Fu. This is a story purely of child abuse. It's She is a child throughout the story. She's got, and, and it's called A Memoir of Healing from Complex Trauma. That's what this one that's what this one is. This one says, A Memoir About Self-Worth. This one says, The Essential Handbook for Escaping Toxic Relationships. This, this last one is good. Healing from Narcissistic Abuse and Complex Trauma. So, you know, it's really a sign of the times that we can have books with a subtitle like that and people understand what it is and anyone will want to read it. So that's pretty amazing. That's, that's a, a shift in just, you know, the last couple of years. This woman is an Asian American. I think she's from Malaysia. She was just really abused. She's an only child, really abused by immigrant parents and they who divorced. And basically she eventually was just abandoned. Like the dad left the house and then the mom left the house and and when she was still a teenager and in school. By age 30, Stephanie Fu was successful on paper. She had her dream job as an award-winning radio producer at This American Life and a loving boyfriend. But behind her office door, she was having panic attacks and sobbing at her desk every morning. After years of questioning what was wrong with herself, she was diagnosed with complex PTSD, a condition that occurs when trauma happens continuously over the course of years. Both of Fu's parents abandoned her when she was a teenager after years of physical and verbal abuse and neglect. She thought she'd moved on, but her new diagnosis eliminated the way her past continued to threaten her health, relationships, and career. She found limited resources to help her, so Fu set out to, de to heal herself and to map her experiences onto the scarce literature about CPTSD. In this deeply personal and thoroughly researched account, Fu interviews scientists and psychologists and tries a variety of innovative therapies. She returns to her hometown of San Jose, California to investigate the effects of immigrant trauma on the community, and she uncovers family secrets in the country of her birth, Malaysia, to learn how trauma can be inherited through generations. Ultimately, she discovers that you don't move on from trauma, but you can learn to move with it. Powerful, enlightening, and hopeful, what My Bones Know is a brave narrative that reckons with the hold of the past over the present, the mind over the body, and examines one woman's ability to reclaim agency from her trauma. That is one piece that happens here is that uh, she does take a, uh, a detour into traumatic abuse for Asian, Asian people that grew up in Asian families um, and also immigrant families. So, because she, she believes that those were you know, big factors in what happened to her. So, so she does focus on that at some point as well. This is more researched and answer than these other ones. You know, these other ones are, you know, more just anecdotal. This one is researched as well, but not nearly as thoroughly as this one. Okay, is Believing Me, a memoir, Healing from Narcissistic Abuse and Complex Trauma by Ingrid Clayton, PhD. Now, what's interesting about this person is that she did what basically I did. Back to school, because you just you need to learn about yourself and there's nothing out there. So you, you go back to try and figure out your own psychology. And that's what she did. She ended up becoming a, a, a you know psychotherapist. And uh, I believe she lives in L.A. What they have done is they noticed the abuse right away. Like, this happened in childhood, she knew it was abuse, and she didn't go on to repeat it, you know. Um, same with this one. She has a nice boyfriend. Uh, as far as I know, Janet McCurdy isn't having, didn't marry a sociopath like I did. So n none of these have the repeated where you s saw this person getting victimized and not fully understanding what's going on, which I think is quite common. And then before they know it, they've, rep they've replicated it and in their uh, own life, in their, in their adult life, now they've got a compounding situation which is what I did. None of these do that. Uh, none of these have that in it. That might be a little bit misleading, I think, from what's maybe the norm. But anyway, so sh this person was abused, but it, it was a little bit subtle. And I, and she, she really describes that well. I think that she goes, you know, she talks about how it was hidden. You know, she doesn't have bruises. She doesn't have, you know, um, she wasn't sure that it was abuse, you know? 
um, she was she was sexualized. This is by his stepfather, sexualized, but he didn't rape her. You know what I mean? It was just it was just an energy. It was just a thing. You know, some inappropriate stuff that she was uncomfortable with, but um, you know, it wasn't it wasn't anything big and profound. You know, he was a physically abusive to her mother. You know, he was just basically a really obnoxious person, and he was, you know, certainly narcissistic, for sure, and made her uncomfortable, and, you know, did some inappropriate things, enough so that, you know, like, even in school, child services and stuff was called, which is kind of amazing, because this person, who was living alone, at first, first she was abused, and then abandoned, and she was completely on her own, there was no child Child services never showed up at her door. It's like her first love is music. She was a singer and stuff like that. And he, he, he also has an interest in music. He uses her, her love for music and things like that as a way to manipulate and her. And then also, this is the big one that will, that will hit people is that her mother doesn't take her side. Her mother doesn't, um, you know, doesn't, doesn't believe her and doesn't take her side. And her mother stays with the man. Um, until he dies. I didn't have bruises. She never left him. He didn't actually rape me. Maybe I wasn't worth believing. Maybe it wasn't that bad. What if emotional abuse is so hidden, its effects remain unchallenged for decades, masquerading as personal failings? Believe Me is an emotionally captivating memoir that gives language to the hidden and ineffable nature of childhood trauma and how it can imprint on a person, resulting in fractured self-esteem, addictions, perfectionism, and a string of abusive relationships. She didn't, I mean, she had self-esteem problems. She, she did develop kind of alcoholic style drinking, but she was uh, clean and sober at 21, which I always think is interesting. Ingrid Clayton had been in the pursuit of healing for a lifetime, including becoming a trauma therapist but she never fully understood what she was healing from. When her stepfather died, she felt a calling to write her way through patterns of lies and denial that had in infected her entire family. She came to face the feelings she had minimized for so long. By reclaiming her story, Ingrid transcended the role of healer into someone becoming healed, showing us what real healing looks like in the process. A quote by Dr. Romani Diversala. This book should be required reading for anyone who wants to learn about complex trauma, narcissistic family systems, and the landscape of healing from trauma. All survivors will see a part of themselves in Ingrid's story. And she has interviewed Ingrid on her channel as well. That's how I was alerted to the book and why I went and got the book. So, of course, it's also, this is well written, very well written, uh, easy, an easy read. You will see yourself in the story, I think. She doesn't have, I don't think she has, I mean, it's not compared to me, but she doesn't seem to have a, a really tragic adult life. I mean, she, she goes and gets her PhD and she's happily married and has a child and, and all that, so I don't see a lot of destruction, um, maybe in the few years before she's 21, but, you know, a lot of people have that, so, um, you know, it's not, it's not a, it's not a story of someone really coming undone. You know, and everything with her, with her stepdad stops short of being really bad. Oh, he does kiss her once, and that was, you know, like a forceful thing. Um, but, you know, it, it mostly stops short of anything that would be criminal or, or anything like that. So, it's, it's interesting, but I think that that's a lot of times what a lot of us are, are dealing with. Just something that feels like it's not right but our parents are saying it's right and our parents are supposed to love us and so what do we know you know and, you, and as a child especially you don't want to believe it you know you want to believe the lie so if, if you have any way of talking yourself out of it you will you know because who wants to believe that, that they're not safe that their parent is exploiting them or abusing them or ignoring them or sacrificing them we don't want to believe that so Anything we can do to not believe that, uh, we'll do. And but of course, that it's not functioning well for us when we're an adult because by then, if you're still doing that, you stop trusting yourself. You don't listen to yourself. You lose your access to your intuition, and you become a, a huge uh, target for for abuse. You become very, very, very vulnerable to abuse, and you become codependent and 
you know, all of that stuff. And that's what, you know, is very common for people who are, who are like me, who don't know while they're in the abuse what they're in. I learned what I was in after it was over and after I made every mistake in the book. You know, I, I was not uh, aware of what I was going through when I was going through it. I was completely lost and totally like a, leading a lamb to the slaughter. I was completely powerless and helpless to do anything right. I was, you know, and also, if you don't know anything, you're not getting any help. This is the other thing is you're, you don't get any help. And this is especially for me, this is like 20 years ago. There are no therapists that knew anything about this. You know, so you're, you're following mainstream advice that's completely the wrong thing to do. And so, you know, you're just, you're just digging deeper and deeper and deeper and you have no idea what's wrong. And you're happy to believe them when they say, you're the problem, you know, okay, I'm the problem. So you go and try and fix yourself, fix yourself and nothing's helping. Um, but, you know, you would rather you be the problem because then you can do something about it and then also you can still be loved. If you're not the problem, you can't do anything and also that's telling me that they don't love me, you know, you know. And to them, you know, being right is the most important thing, but to me, I could be wrong all day. I just wanted, I wanted to be loved. Being unloved was way worse than being wrong, you know. So those are the kinds of things that, that I think are, are typical sort of thought patterns that a person in these situations goes through. And so of, of those typical ways of thinking, I think probably this one is the closest, the you know, most I could relate to the most. I didn't have enmeshed parents. Like I didn't have a Jeanette McCurry kind of mom. I had a neglectful type of mom. And um, I, my parents were a little bit physically abusive, but they weren't as abusive as Stephanie Fu's parents. Um, and, you know, they were settler, you know, they were, they were settler in their abandonment, they were settler in their abuse, you know, so I didn't relate to really those situations of either of those. I didn't relate to, I didn't relate, well, I didn't relate to any of these except for this one. I related to this one and, uh, believing me, but, you know, only just a little because, <laughs> because I, you know, I, just her whole family dynamic and her family situation was set up completely different from mine and also she was more attuned to what was going on and a little bit more self-protective than I was. It did, I did also, it did strike me when that her, that some of the things popped up for her when uh, the abuser died. Um, things, things have changed for me when, like when my son died for sure, it was like everything was new again, all the abuse and everything was new again. I had renewed anger, renewed sent feelings of injustice and all that kind of stuff. But then also when my mother died and um, it wasn't so much just her death as it was the whole reaction from the family and the fact that I didn't go to her m memorial service because, you know, my father and my brother didn't even let me know. They didn't even invite me, you know, tell me about it. And then I saw pictures of my ex-husband there, you know, and things like that. So those are the kinds of situations that I think are really common. And so, you know, I look forward to reading, a, writing a book like that, that people are going to relate to, I think. So anyway, so there you go. So that's five books. If you want to read a book uh, about narcissistic abuse, there are a lot of abuse memoirs out there that are not that great. Um, and I don't want to necessarily come on here and criticize someone's book and maybe I wouldn't maybe I'll just kind of give you the brief of the story but I don't you know I don't really want to come on here and recommend a book or talk about a book that I don't think is a good read it isn't like good writing so in my opinion good writing all right well thank you guys for for watching and please give me a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel and I'll talk with you later okay bye I'd like to know your point of view